Well, and welcome to Opinions. Opinions is just that, you know, our opinion and opinions today by Lionel Rudd, an old friend and a raconteur, someone who has had experiences beyond most of us. He's also a writer, too, in the, one of the latest issues of the Sudbury Living Magazine. You'll find an article, Jenny's Journey, written by Lionel Rudd. You've had a lot of experiences, including health experiences, too, Lionel. We're going to talk a little bit about well, about everything here, and of okay. course, getting your your opinion. Uh, first of all, you've been a, a regular resident at times up at our local health sciences north, and you've survived almost near death experiences. Your overall impression of of, of, of the hospital, how you were looked after, and well, I've got to say this with the with the hospital, the the nurses and the staff, the doctors, the surgeons. Oh, uh, truly amazing. Uh, we've really got uh, what I call a core de elite. Mm -hmm. um, we've managed to attract um, some of the, uh, probably some of the most talented uh, medical people that's available. They're from every uh, country, I guess. We have a regular United Nations uh, at the um, at the hospital. but. It, it, it's just not simply the medical staff uh, who are absolutely amazing, the surgeons and the doctors, um, the guy who fixed my knees, yeah. no scar. No scar. And you had um, two knees, right? Two knees yeah. and I, you, you'd have trouble finding out where he did the work. Yeah. But the, the point is that not only um, are they skilled, uh, when you look at the, um, the, the housekeeping staff um, who interact with the patients, at least they would interact with me. I had one fellow, I think he was a Maple Leaf fan because he wore a t-shirt. <laughs> um, um, but the, the, the fact of the matter is that they do interact and try and uh, work around them with the, the patients. The, um, with the uh, catering, um, you know, everybody says, well, hospital food um, should be condemned at source, <laughs> um, but really and truly uh, at Health Sciences North, um, the food that I got was pretty darn good and there was a, a fair variety, but we had a fellow that came around uh, almost like a maitre d' who took your orders. Oh. Uh, mind you, you had normally only had a choice of two, <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that you, you had choices, <laughs> tea, coffee, milk, <laughs> juice, uh, certain <laughs> desserts. And the main course, you had maybe two or three uh, options, and um, and that was done if you were almost a permanent resident like me, uh, on a daily basis. And then, of course, you, some people have uh, diets and that sort right, of thing. Right. Now it seems like, you know, once you're in there, once you're being treated, things go fairly well. Now, you and I have been both on various committees. I'm on currently on an ALC committee, alternate level of care committee, looking at uh, the situation with respect to. Uh, those who are in the hospital that perhaps shouldn't be there, and you're, you've been on a, another committee looking at actual services to uh, uh, to patients. So there, 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 there are problems as well. Yeah, um, I guess in any uh, organization, uh, to expect it to run 100% uh, perfect and efficient is a little naive. Um, of course, when you get the government interfering, you, you know you can expect things to go mm. off the rails. And of course, I don't hesitate. My criticism is the with the creation of the uh, LINs, and then you've got another tier, which is the CCAC, who basically uh, operate, I think, on funding from mm -hmm. the the That's LINs. Right. Right. And then um, the trouble really began a number of years ago, during the Mike Harris era, when um, they. Um, put out to bid uh, nursing services mm -hmm. and consequently you had the for-profit uh, organizations um, private yeah, yeah, private yeah, yeah. Un under they underbid the VON mm -hmm. and of course the VON was was squeezed out mm -hmm. now once they got squeezed out the for-profit uh, private groups could do what the thing is they liked and so consequently, no, um, we, we do have uh, too many of these uh, for-profit uh, groups. Um, but um, the VON is still there, and I think people have very, very fond memories of the nurses, 
I know from my experience, um, the VON nurses yeah. are absolutely amazing. It's an amazing organization where care is first and uh, not profit. And I think uh, that's something we better better realize and uh, take a better look at. Yeah, the emergency uh, department seems to uh, have had their their share of uh, of well, I guess difficulties over the years for a very variety of reasons. Uh, you know, I, I begin to wonder: Are we a sick society? I was at a clinic last night, and there's about forty or forty chairs in this clinic and I asked the receptionist, I said, there's a lot of chairs here. I said, do you ever fill them up? And they said, oh, all the time. We <laughs> fill these chairs up all the time. Yeah. So it's not only the the hospital emergency department, we have these clinics around town that everybody's, is everybody that sick? What's going on? I know that at one of our, one of our meetings, uh, someone from Germany said, well, emergency departments aren't that full. You only go to the emergency department if you really, really, really have an emergency, a trauma or something. She said, "What what happens is the doctors come to a person's home. Yep. Uh, you know uh, how how revolutionary. I think that's what it used to be like when you and I were kids. Yeah. <laughs> um, but they, uh, yeah, that was the way I was brought up. But the yeah, the doctor went went on his rounds, mm -hmm. and my doctor um, used to carry a sign in in his car." Uh, when he came to an intersection, he would hold the sign out in front of him. It stopped, doctor on rounds. <laughs> and the, the, the traffic stopped. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but the, 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 the sad reality is that, uh, first of all, we, we need mm. uh, perhaps more doctors. Mm. Uh, we have to look at the, uh, the overall demographic. Mm. People are getting older. And uh, so consequently, in the good old days, you had um, the, some of the home red remedies that uh, grandma used to use. And I remember my son had um, a very bad throat, sore throat the whole nine yards. And the doctor says to me, well, I can prescribe something to you for 10, 15, 20 dollars. Mm -hmm. He said, but you could always use granny's recipe, which is identical. <laughs> you, you, you get some honey mm -hmm. and you get some alcohol, mm -hmm. Rye, mm -hmm. rum, or whatever, you mix the two together, and that was the cure. Mm -hmm. Not suggesting that that's the way it should be, uh, without a doctor's. Uh, but the 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 problem with emerge is that it's totally unpredictable. If you're running a grocery store, you know what products you have, and you know your customer base. But the in in the hospital setting. There's no way that they can uh, predict who's going to come in at any given time. Mm -hmm. And I remember anecdotally, I think it was one, uh, either a combination of a long weekend and horrendously bad weather. So mm -hmm. the hospital said, well, we're going to get a flood. Mm -hmm. And they put on extra staff mm -hmm. and <laughs> no, nobody, nobody came. showed up. <laughs> uh, so. You know, it's one of these things that uh, cannot be uh, totally predictable. <laughs> Even the clinics, I understand that sometimes, you know, if it's a nice day out, you're not going to get too many people. You know, if it's a sort of a, uh, a rather unpleasant day, but not really that unpleasant, you'll get more people coming in because maybe they don't have anything else to do. It's, uh, yeah. I, it's, uh, it's sort of an interest. We had suggested the emergency department that maybe nurse practitioners might, 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 might fulfill a role so that uh, sort of ease the, because there's a real situation there, as you mentioned, you know, you never know how many are coming in, but when, when they do come in, and then if you fill up and there's no beds for them, then you become, you become rather, I guess, constipated in, yeah. the, in, the, in the system. Yeah, you gr gridlocked. You just can't move through, it's sort of a gridlock yeah, situation. Yeah. So it's something that, uh, that they are looking at, and it, it, is, it is something that, uh, you know, maybe it goes back to the fact that maybe people aren't looking after themselves well enough, and maybe they're they're going for reasons that uh, are, are perhaps unnecessary. Mm -hmm. But the with the uh, nurse practitioner, I've su I suggested it. I serve on the the president's uh, patient uh, family right. advisory council. Um, a couple of issues. One is, of course, there um, uh, there's issues between the, the doctor and nurses uh, relationship, which is good. You know, like it's not uh, not like it once was what, what, what we thought it was. Yeah. Um, but the other thing was the availability of nurse practitioners. Now, the value of having uh, nurse practitioners is that if you come in 
with uh, probably a broken leg or you've come in with maybe uh, uh, obvious symptoms of a blood clot or something mm -hmm. or other, the nurse practitioner can set you off on a course of tests rather than have to wait for the doctor to mm -hmm. come along mm -hmm. and say, well, you need this test and this test and this test, by which time some of the staff that are employed in that testing area have gone home, end of shift. Right. Whereas a nurse practitioner can siphon off um, some of the patients into the testing area where they could be te to have certain blood tests, x-rays and that sort of thing. So when the doctor, uh, when, when the patient is ready, the doctor is also ready. So what, what was the response to that? Well, they're, they're working towards right, that. Right. And I think that really and truly, um, with the leadership that we now have at the hospital, um, they're, they're becoming increasingly more open, mm. as I say, with the creation of the uh, patient, um, uh, uh, patient Family Advisory Council. They're hearing some of the issues, some of the problems, and they're beginning to take some action. But remember that they're also dealing with an administrative hierarchy. Oh yes, yeah. uh, uh, yeah. which also takes a little bit of a time yeah. to uh, to and, shift. And the budgets too, and that sort of thing. Oh yeah, and, uh, but uh, you know, as I say, yeah. uh, I guess Rome wasn't built in a, in a day, and um, the satisfaction ratings, uh, from what I've seen, have been improving. Yeah, they have been improving. Now there's a few glitches, uh, like on uh, discharge. Uh, for instance, um, the hospital's responsibility is you know, up to the door. Um, the rest is on your, you're on your own. Mm -hmm. And if you go to any surgeon's office, it, it, there's a big notice that says um, you can, uh, if you're going in for a knee, um, make arrangements to leave after four days. If you're going in for a hip replacement, make sure. Uh, and you have to make those arrangements. Yeah. And um, after you've had a knee operation or a hip operation, I defy anybody to get into a shuttle bus or <laughs> any vehicle. Um, and really and truly, there isn't the the um, the the In, the the, uh, the the interface interface, interface, the interface yeah. between your treatment and and being outside. Right. That we, yeah. we we've heard a lot of complaints. I think one heart patient uh, told us that. Uh, he was told to have somebody pick him up, and he says, well, I don't have any uh, relatives. So how about your friends? Well, there's none right here. Well, then have the taxi driver take you. Yeah, and <laughs> I, I, I witnessed that yesterday. There was this very elderly woman, and I wasn't sure. She was wheeled out, okay? And cab driver picked her up, and he had a big, large vehicle, in a van, I think. And he opened the front door and the back door. And it was left up to the cab driver to help her get into the vehicle. <laughs> now, if you've uh, just had some repair work done, and the cab driver obviously isn't trained to lift, carry, and move no, patients, no. that in itself becomes an issue. Um, so, so really and truly, uh, there has to be that um, interface. Uh, the volunteers. Uh, bless their hearts, they work like heck, they ferry you around and you've got the porters, but as I say, once you um, hit the door, um, you, you're yeah, on your own. Uh, and that's not, you can't blame the hospital for no. that. No, and if you're not, you don't get the treatment after that, there's a chance of being back in the hospital once again. Oh yeah, the recidivism yeah. rate yeah. <laughs> yeah. starts to be it's very high. One of the other things that's rather interesting, and I know it at the uh, where, well, where my doctor is, it's sort of a you know, clinic type situation with other doctors and, and they also have a pharmacist now I think and they also have a couple of nurse practitioners and I mentioned, I said, well, you know, do you have anything that does sort of, uh, you know, preventive, preventative medicine, sort of, you know, healthy living? And they said, well, we, so that's, that's not really uh, implemented as yet, which uh, it, it sort of begs the question uh, and we know doctors get paid basically by the, by the number of people they see, mm -hmm. it almost begs the question that they almost don't want you that healthy because unless you're unhealthy, they're not going to make any money. That's right. It's bad for business. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, 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 the thing that happened to me many years ago when I was younger and healthier, 
uh, I went for about 20 years without seeing my doctor. And uh, when I did finally show up, um, they said, oh, you're no longer with us. <laughs> uh, 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 oh, thanks a whole bunch. But the, the reality is that uh, it's like when you have a bank account and you don't use it for goodness knows how long, the, the bank is phoning you up, either yeah. close your account or yeah, we'll yeah. take your money, you know. <laughs> Let's get on another topic. Uh, maybe maybe we should, maybe we shouldn't. Let's talk about elections. We have a municipal election coming up and who knows, maybe a provincial election. But uh, municipal elections deal really with the people. And it seems like over the past number of years there's been a disconnect between the people and our administration through our councillors. And I know, you know, this has been uh, a concern of, for, for many, and not, not only us individual citizens, it seems to be a concern of councillors as well too, that they, they, they're not exactly sure who's running the show. Do you, do, you, do, you, do you see that? Oh yeah, most definitely. Uh, it, it, it's terribly unfortunate because uh, the, 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 the disconnect it is more extreme than we think. Um, certain departments within the municipality rely on consultants. Now, w I went to school to learn to do a job, <laughs> and I, I would consider it a personal and professional insult if I had to, uh, every time I turn around, I've got to get a consultant. That's what I train for, that's what I'm paid to do, mm -hmm. and get on and do it. But it seems that um, in the municipal world, um, when it, even when it comes to painting lines down the Blessed Road, got to get a consultant. And uh, to me, that you know, like um, you, you sp spend three, four, five, six years at university or college, surely you learn uh, enough to perform the function for which you're hired. Is the reason hiring a consultant merely to sort of protect your own, your own position, your own job? In other words, if something goes wrong, you can blame the consultant. Yeah, well, uh, you know, like I hope, like heck, the uh, airlines don't hire their pilots on the same business. <laughs> all right, you, you're trained to do something, and you go and do it. You know, you can't imagine a, an airline pilot having a consultant sitting behind him saying, mm -hmm. "Well, you better press that button." No. Yeah. Uh, and really and truly, you, you, you go to school to study uh, various professions. In private industry, sure, they do hire um, consultants who are normally um, super um, skilled scientific professionals yeah. um, uh, for very specific things. But for uh, general day-to-day -day, um, operations, heck, uh, what do you go to school for? Well, you know, I can understand, you know, the council says they rely on their staff for expert opinion and then, then they go to, to consultants, but even at that, sometimes there seems to be a lack of what we used to refer to as common sense, which doesn't seem to be that common. Sometimes that, that, that some of the uh, recommendations, proposals that come down from staff don't ever seem to be questioned that much by, by council, and some of us in the public say, well, you know, do they, do they do they rely too heavily on this, this so-called expertise without, without questioning it to any extent? Yeah, well, I think it's uh, very healthy um, to, to question even the professionals. Um, you know, you, you go and see a doctor, and uh, if you don't like what he tells you, uh, you can get another opinion, all right? But um, the, the, the fact is that most people travel, and you don't have to physically travel, you know, now we have the benefit of the um, internet and that sort of thing. But um, for instance, when we, we sort of study the favorite traffic, okay, um, most people go on vacation. Now, I, I wonder if people who are responsible for traffic in Sudbury, uh, when they visit another country or another city, don't look around them and say, okay, oh, that, that's interesting that people do it differently here. This is something worth following up. That's true. We have a, I know I was on the Bicycle Advisory Committee for many, many years, one of the founding members, and we used to have people from other communities come to us, and we used to visit other communities, and we would see 
bike and infrastructure, pedestrian uh, safety measures, and yet it seemed to be every time we would present that to to our city people here, they'd say, well, it won't work in Sudbury. I, yeah. you know, matter of fact, you hear that almost with anything that uh, oh. that that that, that uh, possibly would improve quality of life in, here in our community. It won't work here. Yeah, and, and and I guess we can track all that back to hiring practice, uh, and ultimately, the people who do the hiring um, are the ones that we should hold mm -hmm. um, uh, hold responsible. But uh, uh, I refer city planners and I refer city engineers and staff to the municipality of Dagenham in England and that was built um, a whole town about 40,000 people to provide housing for the employees of the Ford Motor Company that was moving in and basically Ford was pretty darn cheap he, he bought a whole bunch of swamp on the Thames and the the city of uh, the town of Dagenham was uh, basically an offshoot of uh, <laughs> that swamp. But what they did, they designed, a, in 1926, they designed four-lane highways. They designed uh, bicycle lanes. Mm. They designed uh, community um, shopping centers, like uh, on certain intersections, you would have a variety of grocery mm. stores, hardware, that sort of thing would be on certain right, intersections. Right. They would place uh, even pubs, um, churches. Next they, to churches. The pubs next to a church is perfect. Well, maybe, <laughs> yeah. Um, the, 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 the thing is, also recreation. Yeah, right. Schools. Yeah. These were all planned uh, in, a, in an era of um, when we were approaching the Great Depression. Right. And yet this whole community to this day is a model uh, and uh, it, it's truly truly amazing to see the recreation they built libraries they built a college there's a a, a park um, that's um, two miles by two miles is it now this is a sort of model community built from scratch as you know Sudbury is very interesting new book out uh, from Meteor Impact to Constellation City uh, is a Finnish professor at the university, excellent book uh, describing Sudbury's history, it should be a textbook for every student in high school, I would think, here in town. But, uh, you know, it describes the building of Sudbury, how really probably it shouldn't be here because of the you know, factors were either between a rock and a hard place or a hard yeah. place and a rock. Yeah. So we only have limited, but it seems like, especially with our, with our traffic infrastructure, well, we can't do anything except make room for cars. Yeah. You know, and... Uh, People and cyclists, well, just sort of fend for yourself. Is there a way around that sort of thinking? Is there compromise that's possible? I know that and the only stretch of bike lanes we have in the entire city along Bellevue, Bancroft, and Howie were put in against the recommendation or the approval of traffic. As I said, there's not enough platform width. It just won't work. They've been put in. Of course, they work fine. Maybe this could happen. And, you know, we see the example of, of traffic calming at enormous expense. Uh, when maybe just an ordinary bike lane would do. So how do you crack through this this way of thinking that we have to accommodate our pickup trucks and not and nobody else? Well, I think it still goes back to your hiring. Mm. And also, um, uh, the principle I have always applied working at the university, never hire anyone smart than, smarter than yourself, all right? <laughs> uh, and I don't care who hears me say that. The, the, the point is, if you do that, they're after your job. Yep. But the, 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 in, in a serious sense, you, you have to have somebody that um, uses their training and their technical knowledge to expand upon that. And it's incumbent on any certified technologist or any engineer or even any doctor to constantly expand on their knowledge rather than confine it. Um, the way back when we had a tra traffic engineer uh, that I got locked horns with and I said what we really need is uh, bus lanes and that way we could express the buses around right. the town yeah, right. and he said well what about um, 
the people sitting in their cars uh, in a traffic hold up and a bus goes whistling, whistling by them. <laughs> I said, give your head a shake. These people might realize one day it's to their advantage to park their car and be on that very bus. Yeah. More recently, when they dug up Notre Dame and put it back together the same way as they started, <laughs> um, they, they had a consultant that they paid $40,000 for. Um, I put in a recommendation that this is an opportunity for Notre Dame to have bus lanes, a bicycle lane, as well as uh, roundabouts. Right. That would be able to start the process of integrating, and you, you just don't simply put in one bike lane without integrating it with an overall traffic system right. and, uh, 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 and all the rest of it. Um, no, totally ignored. Yeah. Uh, and yet that could have been the catalyst to improving um, the traffic mm -hmm. flow as well as uh, uh, people mobility. That's true. Well, we, we've seen these situations develop and right now we're looking at 2nd Avenue, the same thing. The traffic yeah. people say, well, I need to have these lanes for traffic. Well, how about, the, you know, not let alone buses, or how about, how, how, how about the bicycles? You know, well, there's not enough width, really, to accommodate bicycles. And then, well, anyway, but before we leave, we only have a, a couple of minutes left. Who, you know, with this situation we have here in Sudbury, who would run for city council? <laughs> I mean, you have to be, you know, you have to be extremely brave or dumb because to get in this situation where you're going to be dealing with the administration that you can't really have any control over. Uh, you know, there's councillors who are likely going to be elected who have been there for so long that they don't know how to do with things any other way than what they do now. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, how, how do you see the current uh, political climate? Is there any hope at all? Of what, what would save us, in other words? Well, I think, to, to bring it, put it in a nutshell, if you get the opportunity on uh, television, watch uh, yes, Minister, and yes, <laughs> yes, Prime Minister. Right, I know the show. Uh, yeah. uh, and the principle is that the Deputy Minister, who's the full-time civil servant, who's getting an outrageous salary, mm -hmm. his uh, thesis is, well, the average lifespan of a government is four years, mm -hmm. but the civil service are there forever. Goes on, yeah. Uh, and therefore... Um, that they manipulate and connive and all the rest of it because the average politician has only got one thing on their mind and that is I've got to be re-elected mm -hmm. next time around mm -hmm. and, and you have to sort of wonder so, sure some people are run for elected office uh, purely out of community uh, uh, you know they want to be to make improvements but I'm pretty sure that they soon get frustrated by the uh, constant stonewalling of staff, no, not mm -hmm. just Sudbury. I mean, you can probably well, everywhere, go to, yes. anywhere. And then you uh, get the, the counselors who say, well, I'm afraid to, to upset staff. I don't want to really upset them. I know you have to work with them, but the idea that you don't want to upset them is, is rather... Um, well, it's disturbing. <laughs> yes, I'm just uh, searching for the word there. I guess it's disturbing. Yes, it's, 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 it's <laughs> disturbing puts it, uh, and, uh, and, and disappointing. Because well, uh, the idea is, you know, those of us who've been in private business, you know, one of our roles we considered was to upset staff occasionally and make sure they're doing the job. Oh. Yeah, well, it's not a matter of upsetting them. It's a matter of mm -hmm. when you're dealing with staff, to reinforce uh, the things that you, you want to have done and need to have done, but it's also to realize who really is the boss yeah. and uh, who sets the standard. And uh, unfortunately, um, you, you get, uh, I guess when you get elected to public office, I, I, I don't know, I dug deep, but you get certain perks um, it's something to talk about at uh, the, the cocktail parties. Yeah. Well, I serve on this committee, that committee. Right, right, right. But then you have to sort of... The ego of, thing, yeah. Yeah, you have to wake up at the end of the week and say, well, what actually did I achieve? So, we're, yeah, something definitely to think about is we're running out of time. And Lionel, we want to thank you for coming in to our opinions. Of course, these are our opinions, and you can read 
Lionel's uh, piece here on Jenny's journey, an excellent story, a true story of little girl's courage, love, and hope in the latest issue of Sudbury Living Magazine. And uh, keep viewing for another Opinions program. More guests to come, and uh, check us out on friendlytoseniors.ca. Once again, thanks, Lionel, for being with us. And uh, until next time, goodbye for now. Ha <laughs>